Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Dackerman. I am the director at the Cantor Arts Center. And I am here to welcome you and thank you for being here to celebrate Mark Dion and his exhibition. I want to begin by thanking the people who make this kind of project possible and this lecture possible. Bobby and Mike Wilsey, who are the supporters of this series of distinguished lectures, thank you very much. I'd like to thank Sue and John Diekman, uh, who helped bring Mark to campus as part of the Diekman Family Contemporary Commissions Program, so thank you very much. And I'd like to thank Mary Ellie Johnson and Rupert Johnson for helping us bring the Melancholy Museum to life. It's a po Yep, thank you. <laughs> It's support from people like you who makes projects like this one possible. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction and really allow uh, Mark Dion to shine here. But I just want to talk a little about the origin of the project. You know, the Stanford Family Collection is the core of the museum. It's heart and soul. It is the group of objects that the Stanford family themselves assembled. And when I arrived here two years ago, I thought, as the heart and soul of the museum, like, let's reanimate it. Let's figure out a way to take those 7,000 objects that range from fine art objects, antiquities, to, yes, rusty nails, and make it a coherent and meaningful installation. And I knew that Mark Dion would actually be the perfect, uh, uh, the perfect artist for this project. I mean, Mark Dion, like Leland Stanford Jr. himself, is an inveterate collector. Um, if you spend any time with Mark, you know that he's always gathering things. Uh, objects in nature, books, whatever it is. Uh, and in fact, we have all been amused at the museum that when he, he's been coming back and forth to, mu to the museum for a year. And uh, he walks from the hotel up Palm Drive across the campus, and by the time he arrives at the museum, he has... <laughs> a series of objects that he's found, and he's delighted by, that include pine cones and seeds, and we've all been watching this accumulation of Stanford natural history emerge. So when we decided Mark was the ideal, ob uh, the ideal artist for this project, uh, Paul Finland, who teaches in the history department, who is here this evening, and I taught a class together on the history of collecting and the history of curiosity. And we used the Stanford family collection as the basis of this class, knowing that Mark would be coming to visit and that we could turn it into a university-wide scavenger hunt in a way with the students. And so the students were terrific. They helped identify objects for the exhibition. Some of them are here tonight, I see them. Uh, they contributed writing to the gallery guide for the Melancholy Museum. I hope you all have a copy of this. It's a great introduction to uh, the installation. And it was an opportunity to use the material history of the university and the museum as the subject for inquiry for research and teaching here. And you know, it's hard to find those projects. Uh, and when you do, they're really this great experience for the students. So as I hope all of you have seen, the installation is complete and intact. And I think that 
one of the things we have to do is think about it as not only, not a static installation or exhibition, but as a laboratory for further research and learning. Uh, an opportunity for other students to delve into the history of the university, the history of these objects, and present it using different platforms. It's an opportunity for them to write. It's an opportunity for them to invent different digital interpretive uh, modes. So we hope that the exhibition has a long and fruitful life here. So please join me in welcoming Mark Dion for the 2019 Bobby and Mike Wilsey Distinguished Lecture. Thank you. I'm just gonna dive right in, I hope you don't mind. So in 1594, Francis Bacon advises ideal gentlemen that they should have a most perfect and general library to contribute to their wisdom. Also, spacious, marvelous gardens planted with plants from diverse regions and climates. This garden must have rooms and cages for rare beasts and birds. Next to that, a good-sized cabinet or room holding exquisite objects of art and the wonders of nature. Lastly, working studios with vessels, equipment, apparatus, furn and furnaces for experimentation. So he could have been talking about Stanford, right? <laughs> so I am extremely keen on the tradition of the Cabinet of Wonder, right? The tradition uh, from the um, uh, 16th and 17th century, what we might call pre-enlightenment collections, uh, collections that are very much the result of, of, uh, of the emerging um, European colonialism, uh, the, the Europe having its mind blown by the fact that the world is much larger than they ever imagined, containing cultures and things that they uh, had never dreamt of and the Bible never really prepared them for, right? And, and they, they hold objects like uh, specimens, antiquities, ethnographic objects, monsters, new technologies, reliquaries, books, paintings, sculptures, and they may be very different in size and scale, but you know what they share is this idea that they are in some way a universe made private, right? They're a kind of microcosm. Uh, and when you look at these collections, you might think we should call the fire marshal or we should call the uh, psychologist from the program hoarders, but and they seem to be like, uh, uh, you know, these kind of gatherings, random, uh, Porter's expressions, gathers of, gatherings of idiosyncratic and unsystematic things. However, these collections are far from that. They are really complex theater mundi, world theaters, right? They are uh, cosmological organizations of, of the material world, right? And they oscillate between the macrocosm, the world of God and his expression nature, and the microcosm, right? The, the, the world of art, uh, a human's voice, right? And so, so they're, they're surprisingly orderly um, uh, and uh, you know, or, orderly and stratified uh, with elements grounded in interpretation, resemblance, kinship, analogy, uh, you know, and, and they, uh, you know, they are, uh, they're very much organized around uh, allegories, right? So uh, the elements, the humors, the seasons, the zodiac, uh, the virtues and vices and other symbolic systems of meaning. So understanding individual objects uh, is difficult. They're obtuse and complex, and they have both a material value, and you know, as kind of treasure art and specimens, uh, and but also very often, especially in the collections in the South, a magical value. Right? The objects may be pragmatically magical. They may have powers to protect you, to ward off evil, to betray treachery in your presence. Uh, I think it's really hard to wrap our head around that aspect. You know, we like to think about these things as the origins of science and the beginnings of the Rational Museum, and I think you can also look at them as sort of the ends of the alchemical tradition or the Kabbalic tradition or other, other traditions of, of magic and um, in which they embody, you know, they embody uh, secret knowledge, right? At the same time, they're trying to find within this gathering the blueprint of God himself, right? God has encoded in nature uh, meaning, and to gather these things and interpret them is to understand the meaning of the world, and perhaps, like in alchemy, 
to reconnect that direct connection that humans once had with God himself. So there's a lot more going on in these collections than the origins of museums, right? Um, and uh, so, um, you know, the collectors themselves are always central. It is their vision, their cosmology. They may be princes, scholars, higher clergy, merchants, uh, and, uh, and they may organize their collections around, around their concerns, be that financial, intellectual, political, theological, magical, but the collector themselves are always in the center of this. Um, and, you know, and the collections are dynamic, right? They, they have a role in diplomacy and pomp. When you have someone over to look at the collection, you are, uh, you know, you might be uh, testing their education, their erudition, their abilities. Uh, they're, they're very discursive. You know, people are always talking in these images. You know, we only have a handful of images about these collections, and there are always people in dialogue. The collections might be dynamic, right? Things could be traded and swapped. And, and uh, uh, so, so in that way, that model that we have of the static museum doesn't so easily overlay onto these collections. Um, and, and you know, the, the development of the Wunder camera is very much parallel to the development of the university, right? So you have, uh, you know, you have the winter camera as, as the gathering of all material things, and you have the university as a gathering of all ideas, of all knowledge. And so I like to work with this model of the Cabinet of Wonder. And you might say, why would anyone work with the model of the Cabinet of Wonder? It is something from a long time ago. But I do find within the Cabinet model, even working with rational scientific collections, you can, you can find new ways of doing things that the rational museum presentations do not do. New areas to touch. Look at uh, roads not taken in the Enlightenment in terms of the organization of things. So this is, I work often with museums and sometimes with museums that are not um, art museums. So this is actually the Oceanographic Museum of Monaco where they let me loose for about two years. And you know, many museums have a problem, which is they only exhibit between one and 10% of what they actually have. And every museum wants to get more of these things out in the world, right? It does no one any good to have the majority of the museum in cardboard boxes and under stairwells. So one of the reasons why people invite me to come in and do it is that I get things out. I'm a stuff person. So the first time I actually can overimpose this, this um, model of the Cabinet of Wonder and the university was at the Wexner Center, which is part of Ohio State. You know, Ohio State has 65,000 students, spread over uh, 1,700 acres, 460 buildings, 14 colleges, with 175 different majors, and over uh, 15,000 courses. So it is in many ways a microcosm, we could say. Right, and, and you know, museums collect. I mean, universities collect. They don't always think they collect. So some of them, of course, have formal museums, like the Cantor, and some of them don't, but you still need a teaching collection. If you teach geology, you need rocks and minerals. You just can't teach geology without it. You can't teach music if you don't have an instrument collection. Then there's also the museum's own story, right? The, the university archives, where they tell their story through things from the past, through letter sweaters and, and trophies, right? And, uh, and you have uh, the microscope that sat in the back of the closet for so long that you couldn't really throw it away anymore. So these things are part of, become part of the museum's heritage. And, and, you have, and you have someone's who works at the museum, their, their Hello Kitty collection, and their pictures of their kids at their desk. So there's a lot of collections in, in the university. So I worked with a really brilliant um, curator named uh, William Horrigan, who's a, normally a film video curator, but is just a kind of genius guy. And he said, like, come to the museum, I mean, come to the university, we will create a, a project, whatever you want to do. And I thought, university, universe, let us make a microcosm, and we'll try to build something that is very unexpected in this Peter Eisenman uh, um, postmodern monstrosity of a building. So, um, <laughs> uh, so I also want to use some symbolic language of, of the representation of space. So, like a like a Freemason hall, you have two doors, right? So the idea is that you 
enter through one door and you leave through the other, and that represents a transformation, right? A transformation of consciousness in the experience that you had. And so you enter that, and then you find yourself on a round platform, which represents the rotunda, right? And the rotunda is the thing in the 19th century which democratizes the museum. It gives the viewer the power to make a choice. I can go up the stairs to the old masters, I can go left to Egyptology, I can go right to Greece and Rome, right? So, so suddenly it puts the, the visitor in the driver's seat. So I wanna do something that references that. And then across from that, you have a, a, a microcosmic ordering of things from many of the different departments in the university, but not in a way that anyone in the university would ever organize them, right? And it's built also in a, a semicircle. It's built so even a basketball player couldn't reach out and grab something. So, so there's no glass separating you from the objects. It's just the space. So you are quite intimate with the things, but you can't touch the things. Very important. Registrars hate me. <laughs> Uh, and so, and so, of course, I wanted to organize these. Uh oh, that. Hmm. I yeah. Oh, come on, baby, you can do it. Okay. Oh, it's. Hmm. Oops. Hold on. You just pull that out. I don't know what to say. Oh, well, we get an image anyway. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, so I went all over the university to try to find the things that were collected. So things, so, um, so in some cases, very, very easy. What's that? Which slide? Uh, I think that's good. Uh, in some cases, that was very easy. They're formal collections. We could go through and borrow things. They have a very large uh, zoological collection. They have special collections at the library. Uh, and, but then I also needed to mix up the categories as well. So I wanted to come up with my own categories, my own allegorical categories. And I look very much to, um, say, um, a, um, Flemish and Dutch still life as, well, as a way of thinking about that as much as the winter camera. So the first category is the underworld, and this represents all sorts of things from the Department of Mycology and Mineralogy, some very ancient dinosaur models. Uh, the water, uh, the, um, the aquatic world. Oops, what happened to it? Did we lose air? Let me go back there. Water, air, oh, something happened to air, I'm sorry. Uh, well, there's a detail from air, okay. Uh, air, and here you see things from engineering. Uh, of course, there's a, a very large en engineering program. We see bird eggs, bird specimens, uh, the allegory of uh, the earth. Uh, there is the allegory of humankind, which we're skipping, but the allegory of the library. And this has all sorts of amazing things in it. You know, just, you know, there's a complete collection of Beardsley's yellow books. And the spe this, this one has uh, objects from about 17 different special collections libraries that are within the university itself. So um, I want to show kind of some of that richness, but I can't, show, I can't really indicate every single thing. Then there's the allegory of sight, right? It just so happens that uh, at uh, Ohio State, we have a very prominent celebrity eyeglass collection. So we have um, uh, some Elton John eyeglasses, Colonel Sanders eyeglasses. We had George Bush Sr.'s eyeglasses, which were interestingly chewed at the end, like, these are like damn Saddam, <laughs> you know. Uh, and uh, 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 an optometry collection, uh, and also at the top we have the model for the Saul Lewitt that was built there, uh, and, we, and in, um, uh, in one of the collections they have a vast collection of vernacular photography, including the last wolf in Ohio, a man with six fingers, 
uh, and an image of the quagga, the last quagga on Earth um, in Amsterdam Zoo. So the, this is a, an extinct zebra, which, uh, anyway, I, I, don't want, I don't want to tell you why it went extinct. It's too depressing. Um, uh, the allegory of history which also has lots and lots of objects inside. Uh, and again, we're, we're looking at things that are coming from dozens of different departments. So, you know, our methodology uh, for doing this was just to cold call or knock on someone's door and say, hey, what do you got? What do you, what do you happen to have that we could borrow? And someone would say, well, you know, we actually have this incredible collection of uh, World War II um, uh, uniforms, or we have uh, collections of minerals that we use uh, in the ceramics. So from there, I wanted to continue with this model, but I also wanted to expand the model to, uh, to a pedagogic model, because we're working at universities. So in this case, we created a kind of seminar, a museum seminar. I'm talking about when I say we, in this case, it's Colleen Sheehy, Dr. Colleen Sheehy and I. And each of the students were assigned one of these cabinets. So they had to go out like detectives into the university to try to recover these things. And we also had the opportunity to make a nod to the 19th century by creating a salon wall, you know, a wall that, that had uh, two-dimensional objects. And they, they have wonderful collections there, like they have a children's um, illustration collection, which has, you know, the original drawings for Goodnight Moon and and you know, really wonderful Maurice Sendak drawings and things like that. Uh, for some reason, there are trophy heads there. There's the key to the city. There's a little Tiffany fragment. Uh, and then we have the cabinet itself, uh, which um, because of museum economy, this is the same cabinets which have been refitted so they're no longer in a semicircular shape, right? So, uh, and, and this is very, this, um, is built as a kind of hallway. So you pass through these cabinets. Um, you, uh, again, you first encounter the underworld, which also features uh, things from the collection of death and mourning, always something I'm keenly interested in. Uh, the aquatic world, uh, the world of air, again, the terrestrial world, We have a great mixture of things from the scientific collection, including one object that probably would have been in an original Cabinet of Wonder, this ball, which is a bezoar. And a bezoar is a, a, it's essentially a giant hairball. And so this is a hairball that came from the Department of Veterinary Medicine, which has a wonderful uh, collection. And you know, this is my favorite hairball. And then, of course, we also have two-headed cows and uh, cyclops cows as well. So any you know, of bezoars, bezoars can be uh, either hard or, or felt like this, and they have enormous magical properties in the Cabinet of Wonder. Uh, we have the Cabinet of Humankind, which the student was very engaged in looking at, uh, uh, can we say, man's inhumanity to man or man's inhumanity to everything else. Uh, so, uh, so you know, had uh, um, ideas of suffering and bondage next to those of, of luxury. This is the archive, uh, and in which uh, we also use the the uh, tusks of woolly mammoth as part of the archive and library. And we expand kind of this is this is a much more I think richer interpretation of books itself the allegory of vision, and each one, of course, has a, a paradigmatic object on top, right? There's a kind of iconic object. In this case, uh, we have Hera's peacock, right? And we have a moy bridge in there. There is also a very large eyeglass collection, uh, but this is, uh, but none of these, I think, are, for, are from celebrities, but they are about celebrities like the green Herbert Hoover glasses that you would wear when you're canvassing for Hoover. Uh, the allegory of sound and time. And at last, the allegory of history, which also has next to it a, um, a Hoover dress. So when you're canvassing for Hoover. So, so again, these are, there are marvelous collections of wonderful things, terrible things, uh, things that uh, evoke our worst possible 
histories and, and desires, um, costume collections, ethnographic collections, natural history collections. So all of those were, were again, very difficult. We have to go to each department and we have to convince people to let us see their collections, have access to the collections, to move the collections, to recontextualize the collections in ways that they may not think are, is respectful, but I think it is. Uh, so the most difficult of these projects, uh, and the last one I'll kind of show you in this vein, is uh, um, this is, was a part of an exhibition called Weltwissen, World Knowledge and it was about 400 years of science in Berlin, starting with the uh, first uh, teaching hospital, the Charité Hospital, 410 years ago. So uh, in this case, the, um, we built an enormous cabinet. You know, each of these cubbies are, you know, it's, it's um, two by two meters, so six by six feet more or less. And each of the objects uh, it represents one of the departments and, and uh, a field of science within that. So we start on the left with the natural sciences, we go to the right to the abstract sciences, and in German university education, many things were science, pretty much everything except drama, art, and theater uh, are sciences. So, um, so yeah, that is a person to give you the scale. Now in this case, I actually had to go to the offices of people like maybe the most eminent uh, Egyptologist in the world and knock on her door and say, hey, you got something about Egypt I can borrow? <laughs> and it would be wonderful if it's sort of the size of a washing machine or, you know, so, it, not the, again, not the easiest project to organize. But you don't actually see this project this way at first. You actually see it from behind. So you enter, this, this was part of a very large exhibition about the history of science in Berlin. Very rigorous, very serious, with, with kind of pull-out sections on you know, the history of chemistry, the history of art history, the history of critical theory, the history of biology, and very critical and very um, uh, rigorous. So they wanted something that in some way, I always think about it a little bit like making a really great book jacket for an amazingly uh, rich book. So, but, you, but anyway, you come to the piece from behind. So you see everything in this almost like platonic ideals, right? You see these, these shadowy figures which you don't really understand what they are. So, um, so that's the way you enter the space and then finally you are in the space with these objects, all of which, every single one, has an amazing backstory, whether that's a, a mathematical problem or whether it's a machine whether it's a, um, a biological specimen. So also from the balcony, there are uh, uh, telescopes which you can use to see the objects. And when you hit sort of every third object, it will give you a recorded story of the backstory of this object. So you'll learn about the importance of this computer, or you'll learn that one of these speakers uh, you know, is, is the speaker uh, Hitler used at the Nuremberg rally. So like these things have really strong references uh, in them because of course 400 years of science in Berlin are not 400 bright years of science in Berlin as well. So, so it's meant to be a very critical piece. So my understanding when Susan brought me here was that we were gonna do a project like this, looking across Stanford and and thinking about the university uh, as a universe, as and as a universe of material things, and it was going to be one of these uh, very extended treasure hunt projects, uh, and uh, and then she showed me this building, uh, and you know this building, uh, you know which is which is built at the same time as the Metropolitan in New York and the Museum of Fine Arts in Philadelphia and the Museum of fine arts in Boston, but by the time it's complete, it's much larger than any of those, right? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and she introduced me to these people, and she brought me through the museum and the space and told me the kind of backstory of the Stanford family and the origins of Stanford University and the Stanford Museum. She showed me this remarkably unusual painting. And, you know, one of the things, one of the first things I did when starting to realize, like, Oh, wait a minute, 
she doesn't want me to do that at all. This is something entirely different. This is something that really is about the origin story of Stanford, which is a very particular origin story. You know, not every museum, in fact, very few museums have really crystal clear origin stories that are compelling and interesting and, and are something that is relatable, but this one clearly did. Uh, and I, I spent some time listening to the docents and asking the docents, and uh, which it seemed like they already knew I was going to be reorganizing the collection before I did. And, and, and they said, whatever you do, please don't take Palo Alto Spring away, you know, this, this really uncanny painting, uh, because it's such an important uh, um, didactic object in this telling the story. And I, was, and I thought, oh, that painting is going to go, you know. <laughs> and then I looked at the painting, and I was like, you know, they're totally right. You know, and, and Susan expressed to me, you know, this origin story is really about the death of a child. It's profound and deep, and it's a real bummer. And can we use these rooms in some other way that's not so heavy, that's not so oppressive? That's, is there another story beside the morning story? And I went away thinking about this, and, uh, and Susan gave me a pile of books for homework, and I spent a lot of time reading about this, reading about the lives of the Stanfords, and I came back thinking, there is no other story, right? I mean, the, this is, this tragic story is the story here, and it's really powerful, and it's, re, and it's, um, it, it's a compelling story, and it's a story anyone can relate to. I think, I mean, undoubtedly, I feel like as someone who is a parent of two, two children, I think that was part of my interest in this. I don't know if I could have done, would have been interested in the same way if I wasn't a parent, actually. And so, you know, all of that really um, led me to, to want to go down uh, this rabbit hole, which is also the rabbit hole of the culture of mourning in the Victorian and Gilded Age, which is really very strong and very particular, right? The, 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 um, and cultural mourning in, in Victorian um, England, of course, really starts with the death of, of Prince Albert in 1861 and the, and the lifelong um, mourning of Victoria after that, right? Which is so public and is such a focus of, of uh, Victorian culture. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, of course, you have the development of the uh, Park Cemetery movement uh, in, on continental Europe with Pierre Lachaise. You have the necropolis in Glasgow. Uh, you have them popping up in the United States as well in Boston. Here in the United States, of course, we have the, uh, the, the um, tragic deaths of young people in the Civil War, which it touch, it touches everyone everywhere, as well as the assassination of Lincoln and the tour that his corpse did, uh, uh, which also uh, made popular the field of embalming, right? So, um, you know, there are very strict rules about um, uh, mourning culture, right? A widow is expected to be in mourning for two years, right? Uh, a, uh, a, um, let me see, I've got this great chart here I wanna look at. I wanna get this right, because it's being recorded, and. I'm going to get a lot of trouble if it's not. Uh, okay, so, uh, so around some of the rules and etiquettes of mourning, right? We have a widow must wear mourning attire for two years, siblings and older children a year, grandparents six months, aunts and uncles three months. So, uh, and you know, of course, there is a vast culture of mourning that involves fashion and jewelry, and you know, and fortunes are made. Uh, selling black crepe and uh, and uh, cameos with hair pieces inside and, and hair of the deceased and woving into watch farbs and jewelry. So uh, there's you know there's a rigorous business in post mortem photography. So the public uh, ritual of mourning is very strict and it's especially strict on women. Men are not. Um, uh, all of the times for men are much less so, and the dress requirements are also far less uh, uh, deep. We have, you know, we have deep mourning also, one f the first form of mourning, then ordinary mourning, then second mourning, which is when there's an anniversary or birthday, and then half mourning, and half mourning is when you can switch to grays and lavenders and you don't have to wear black, and that can be prolonged for a very, very long time. 
So, you know, this is the culture that um, the Stanfords live in. So, you know, we know that, you know, here is young Leland Stanford. Leland Stanford, of course, had every possible privilege a young person could have in the time, is extremely well educated, has great tutors, also has wonderful access to the outdoors, loves shooting birds and animals here on the Stanford campus. Uh, he loves uh, riding, you know, he is, uh, um, uh, he shows great aptitude. He likes to dig up artifacts of the original people who lived here. And he goes on a two-year trip when he's 12 with his mother uh, to Europe. Uh, they go everywhere, you know. They go to ev all the major cities. He begins collecting in earnest. And, uh, and of course, and he's 12, right? So he's impressed by war. He's impressed by stuffed animals. He wants to buy things like swords. He wants to find bullets from uh, the battlefields of Napoleonic battles. It's a 12-year-old boy's collection. And, uh, and so when he comes back home, he established his, his international museum uh, on the top floor of the Knob Hill House, right? And it has all of these curiosities. It has things that people brought him. Of course, people who are doing business with the Stanfords realize that if you bring a thing for the kid, you might, it, they might look a little more favorably on your request. So, um, and, uh, and in the, in the mid-period between that and his next trip to Europe, he's also spending time in New York. He's going to things like World's Fairs, and uh, his notebooks that are here are just so incredibly charming, because they describe how he spent every penny. So, I lent $2 to Mama, I bought ice cream, entrance to the museum. He goes to the zoo every day. Uh, he hires people to help him carry all the stuff that he's bought home. So, you know, I feel like the story is, is really rich. So this is, this is how the exhibition looked before. The ex I know people were upset with the idea of changing the exhibition. The exhibition has already been changed twice in our century. So that's the exhibition as I came to it. This was the exhibition, which I, I never saw. That was the exhibition in the earlier part of our century. And of course, the archives and, uh, of, of the university and of the museum are absolutely filled with elements from the life of these um, extraordinarily wealthy people and, uh, and uh, their uh, Gilded Age sensibility. So everything is bringing me back to the importance of the Gilded Age, where more is more. And the uh, and uh, and of course the culture of collecting and, and the culture of telling stories through material accumulation. So this is Stan Leland's museum in his home, which he and his mom organized and uh, and had furniture built for, and it shows all of his obsessions and interests, which are not unlike other 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds' interest, except he actually has the means to acquire these things, right? He has the means to, um, to um, build this material. And he's, you know, he's clever. This isn't just, he's not just throwing this together. This is actually a drawing we found in his notebook, which is a drawing of the, uh, you know, this is the sketch of what, of how he's gonna lay these things out, right? So, um, and this is how they end up getting laid out. And again, it's, it's very organized like a proto-universal museum. He has all of the categories. He's organizing things around natural history, ethnography, archaeology, war, in the same way that you might find in, in a comparable museum um, um, in Paris or New York. You know, by, so his second uh, by the time he gets to Europe the second time, he's much more disciplined, right? He's spent time with museum directors. Uh, he has spent time uh, discussing with professionals the disciplines of archaeology, uh, and, uh, and he visits other sites, uh, meeting archaeologists, even Schliemann, of course. And, uh, and so his engagement is intense and real and becoming very focused around archaeology. At the same time, he's also spending time in living artist studios. So when he goes to Rome, he's hanging out with contemporary sculptors. His, his mom comments on how he just wanders off and spends the day in the, in the atelier of living artists. So, you know, it's kind of an extraordinary thing. And then, of course, he's dead. Right. I mean, he dies before his 16th birthday. And that 
changes everything, right? It, it, so his, his, if you want to be generous about it, his mother's um, uh, response to that is to say, the children of California will be my children, right? And to continue making that, uh, making the museum, she fantasized that her son would actualize in his life, and of course the university itself, right? So it's an extraordinary story. Uh, and in the other exhibitions of, of the Stanford Family Galleries, there's not, I think there's not much emphasis on this idea that this all begins with this young person's collection. And I think collecting begins with young people's collecting. There are a lot of collectors who begin very early and they just never leave that compulsion. They may discipline it. They may take it in other places. Uh, some may not. Uh, some may not discipline it, I mean. Uh, and they may turn it into uh, fairly lucrative art careers. I, you know, but anyway, they, you know, there are, um, uh, you know, there are things, uh, there, there are th when, when Susan says that's the core of the museum, I think that's also the core of collecting, right? And so the kind of delight that you find in Leland's selection is very much guiding my, th my process when I'm thinking about this exhibition. So what we do is we dive in to the museum's basement and we find boxes that haven't been looked at since the museum was evacuated after the last earthquake. So they're things that are wrapped in newspaper. The, there are no necessarily, there's not necessarily reference for what these things um, are exactly. So we have to do some homework. We have to really research and do a deep dive into a mysterious uh, card catalog, which sometimes references things and you're not sure, is this the thing or not? So uh, I worked a lot with the team here. You know, that We had a, a marvelous team to, uh, uncover objects from the collection and to try to imagine how we might uh, reorganize these. Again, I really want to organize things around this culture of, of uh, death and mourning and as Susan says, love, which I think is really at the heart of this in a sense. Uh, and uh, so it was spent many months um, working with the team, going over things and also working with the team trying to figure out how are we actually going to exhibit this? How are we going to exhibit this thing that's falling apart? How are we going to exhibit this thing that was never meant to last 125 years? How are we going to exhibit this thing that can't be exposed to light? And so, um, and so this is how we do it, right? And so this is the, is the morning cabinet, which again, going back to my theories of, of early Wonder camera sensibility. It is uh, it is organized around the allegories, and the allegories are classical or allegories that that uh, Leland Jr. would have recognized from Aristotle. So uh, you know, um, earth, air, ether, water, and fire. Right. So uh, those are those are the selections. We have to figure out some way to organize these things. Right. And so I think I love moving forward by looking backward. Right. There are, in addition to the objects that are primarily on display, there are the um, vitrines, and there are more than 50 drawers, which articulate also some of the uh, concerns of these elements. Not all of the objects are in perfect condition. I think they probably weren't in perfect condition when they were produced, but uh, you know, we work with a lot of things that are um, are really beautiful. We have, I believe that those are the remains of Leland's last, bre last breakfast. The alabaster fruits. Uh, we have elements here from the culture of mourning. We have the cast of Jane's hands surrounded by jet beads, which certainly would have been part of her mourning attire. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the history of the institution itself. This is the cabinet dedicated to the, um, the, the 1906 earthquake, which of course destroyed three quarters of the museum, right? So the, uh, what was the largest museum, uh, la largest private uh, museum in the world, three quarters of it is destroyed in the 1906 earthquake, leaving only one quarter, which is, the, which is um, you know, the, the core of the, of the museum, the entrance that we all now kind of benefit from its uh, sustained beauty in a way. So this is a work that very much, this is a piece that very much acknowledges another sense of loss. Other senses of loss are also dealt with in this work, which focuses on the grief 
not the grief of the of uh, uh, the super wealthy of the of the Gilded Age, but the grief of a working man who worked as the dam keeper here, um, whose wife died, and uh, he bought a case of whiskey and burned all of her belongings. And so the archaeology uh, team have unearthed this, and this um, this um, vitrine kind of tells the story of that. Uh, and then we'd enter the other room. Again, Palo Alto Spring remains essential because it is the weirdest painting. And through it, I think <laughs> we can talk about some, in, you know, it's, it's, there's so much encoded in that painting about class, about power, about race, about uh, representation, you know, the fact that half of the people are dead in the painting. Uh, the, there are people in the painting who never existed. There are people who are very prominently existed. And, there's just a lot going on in that painting that's worth examining, and I, I thank the docents for pointing out that importance. Um, and then using the opportunity to, again, try to get as many things out as possible, but also working with the Department of Archaeology, who are very generous in their support of this project, to, uh, to do something, I think, that hadn't been done, which is to mix vernacular objects, everyday objects, with, with Gilded Age objects as well. So to begin to try to tell some of the other stories, and I think the drawers do this even better, to talk about you know, what is the basis of the wealth of the Stanfords, where does it come from, what perpetuates it, who perpetuates it, you know, who are the people who work there. So stories of the of immigrant labor, stories of the workers, the kind of um, people who are very much invisible in at least the way the Fine Art Museum has told this story before, are present um, throughout um, some of the exhibits in this space. Of course, the importance of horse rearing, you know, um, as far as I know, in all the research I've seen and in other sources, Governor Stanford just could pick a horse. This is a guy who really knew horse confirmation. I mean, he just had an extraordinary eye for horses. And, uh, uh, and uh, I love the way you reward your champion horse by scalping it and putting it on display. But um, so, uh, you know, we definitely want to talk about that. And, and, and of course, that's, that's no stranger to us than, uh, than the death masks, which also, as far as I know, have never been exhibited uh, altogether before. Um, and there's a, there's a little nod to Leland Jr., who was, uh, you know, a, a, amongst the many other things he, he was, amongst, uh, um, you know, a, a burgeoning classicist and a, um, um, uh, an amateur archaeologist and, uh, uh, and uh, a scholar, was also a photographer, right? So he, um, had a wet plank camera in Paris when he was 13 and took photographs, and they're not so bad. Of course, it helps to have Moybridge as your teacher, but. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, here's an example, I think, of, of trying to include some of these vernacular objects and trying to make a nod. You know, this is not an exhaustive didactic exhibition that tells you every aspect of the Stanford story. Two rooms could not tell the the Stanford story, and two rooms certainly cannot tell the story if you're trying to include all of the people who the Stanfords are standing on their back to make their fortune, right? But um, there is a sort of nod to the original inhabitants in, in some of the objects that Leland collected that came from here. Uh, there's also a broken shovel and a dynamite plunger, which to me really represent the um, the, the gold rush, and those are borrowed from my friends at the Oakland Museum, uh, and I've used those in the exhibition I did with the Oakland Museum, so I love the idea of, you know, what are they gonna do with them? No, no one's dying to see these two beautiful things, <laughs> but uh, I love the idea that I've done it twice now. Um, and also the idea of, of mixing uh, some of these broken fragments from the Gilded Age household with everyday bottles, right? I mean, the idea of really trying to, in some way, trying to interject some challenging things into this space, which people have been critical of because it's not, uh, you know, Stanford Family Galleries are not enough of an art space. So I want to try to push that and like, let's make it even less of an art space in a way and, and include the stories of everyday life. And uh, so I think about this as, as an exhibition that really does, in some way, try to spread out and touch and broaden 
the story that has been told, but I also think about it you know, as an artwork. And so uh, it in, in many ways uh, uh, does not necessarily tick all the boxes that you might uh, anticipate from uh, a didactic historic uh, exhibition, but tries to do other things and tries to work, and certainly in the morning um, gallery space, on, on a more emotional level, right? A lot of my work really uses humor as the fulcrum. And this is a project where I can't say that that was possible because the, the core of this is such a tragedy that it's really hard to, uh, you know, even though there are funny moments and amusing juxtapositions, there's nothing really funny about this story. So uh, at the same time, I think that uh, it does seduce with beauty and quality and, um, and scholarly rigor, which, you know, is what uh, I think are the values of Stanford. So, in conclusion, thank you.